Good evening. Welcome to our monthly Leaders Live call. When I say our call, I'm talking about the joint call hosted by the Douglas Leadership Institute and the Frederick Douglass Foundation. Uh, we have these meetings every month and we bring um, credible speakers and, um, and relevant subject matter to you to help encourage, inspire, equip you in the work that you do. My name is uh, Arnold Colbreth and I serve as Director of Ministry Engagement with the Douglas Leadership Institute. And it's just a blessing to, to look across the screen uh, each week and to see all of your faces and your names and to think about the various cities and states that you live and, uh, and serve and, and uh, impact uh, for the cause of Christ. So thank you for joining us again tonight. As I say each month, the purpose of this conference call is ministerial and organizational engagement and education. Uh, it is not intended for the press. Um, boy, we've been having some good calls and tonight is no different. We are now in the month of June and tonight we're going to talk about the lasting legacy of Juneteenth and we've got an incredible night planned for you tonight. Let me open us with prayer and then I'm going to yield the floor to our national chairman, uh, Bishop Dean Nelson, and he will uh, facilitate our, our discussion tonight. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you. We honor you and we bless your name. We thank you, God, for this time that's been uh, consecrated, uh, uh, set apart, oh God, for, for this purpose. Holy Spirit, we invite you in. We say, have your way, Father, just because this isn't a, a traditional church service doesn't mean we don't want you to be at the helm. We want you to lead, you guide, you speak, you encourage, you inspire, you equip, oh God. That, that's what you do so well, and we honor you and bless your name. Thank you for all of these incredible women and men on this call. Father, thank you uh, by faith for those that will watch by rebroadcast, oh God. May they be encouraged and strengthened in the work that they do as a result of our dialogue tonight. Father, bless Bishop Dean Nelson, bless our leadership team, bless our guests tonight. We give you the honor and the praise in Jesus' name, amen. Bishop Nelson, I yield the floor to you, my brother. Amen, amen. Hey man, this is a great, great opportunity. Every month of gathering together, uh, virtually with uh, you all leaders from around the country, uh, some from the Douglas Leadership Institute and some more specifically with the Frederick Douglass Foundation. But man, I'm excited as I'm looking around. I see we've got some great friends and people. I see uh, Dr. Deborah Honeycutt chiming in. It's awesome. Great to see you, Dr. Honeycutt. I see uh, Latoya from uh, FDF of Maryland. Uh, Denver Jones. I see my buddy Tom Cacadellis from North Carolina. Man, this is exciting. I got J.R. Gurley from Virginia. I see Cheryl Sullaway from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Fern Taylor. Man, thank you guys for joining. I got Pastor Gaines from here in Maryland. Pastor Jewel Simmons, man of God, on the, sh on the line with us tonight. So, I'm so grateful for all of you that uh, have joined us. Uh, thank you so much. This is a very important event that we do every week. And just to let you know that we are working together to make this uh, successful. Um, one, it's successful because you guys are here. Two, it's successful because some of the great leaders that you have the opportunity to hear from. And uh, we want to make it successful. So if there are people that you know or believe that should be on, uh, send them a quick text, uh, forward them an email and tell them to jump on because this is Leaders Live. That means that you have the opportunity to comment. You have the opportunity to raise some questions uh, live with some of our special guests. And so I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce to you all tonight uh, somebody that I have known probably for about a decade now, uh, Pastor Joseph Green. Dr. Green is a husband and father, businessman, and published author. In September of 2016, Dr. Green started the 2019 Movement, a movement aimed at racial and cultural reconciliation. In October of 2018, he was congressionally appointed to the United States 400-year 
African American History Federal Commission and served as its first chair. And we'll hear a little bit about that and how that came about. Dr. Green is the senior pastor at St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He is the Pennsylvania ministry leader for Capital Ministries and is a facilitator of cultural intelligence training. Dr. Green is the author of several books, including Kingdom Business. He is a man of God and a great friend. Dr. Green, welcome to Frederick Douglass Foundation's Leaders Live tonight. Thank you, Bishop. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. I'm excited about the topic, and I'm just uh, honored to be a part of this, uh, such a prestigious group of uh, men and women of God. Yeah, man, I'm telling you, I'm looking at some of the people on here right now. We got doctors, we got attorneys, we got elected <laughs> officials. I see Pastor Chip Montier is on with us. So yeah, we you, you got a distinguished group. And uh, we want to, uh, just so that you guys are a part of this note, we want to get this uh, these numbers up. This is a valuable piece. And yes, we do a, a recording and we re-release this uh, so that people can see it. And it's also can be found. Uh, on our uh, YouTube page that you can uh, access and send out at any point. But uh, we're grateful for all of you. And uh, we want to help to uh, get those numbers up. We'd love to see us uh, exceed 75 up towards 100. And so uh, you guys can help us in the near future to get to those numbers. And we're really grateful. Dr. Green, let's talk a little bit about you first. And we're going to get to our main topic tonight about Juneteenth, because there's a lot to uh, celebrate. And there's also uh, some things to kind of, you know, maybe reemphasize and to uh, maybe even help educate uh, some people on the value of Juneteenth. But let's start with you. Uh, I first met you through a friend, a prayer warrior, uh, Pierre Bynum, who worked at the time at the Family Research Council. He told me that you just got to meet this fantastic guy uh, who is a pastor in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and uh, how it was that the Lord set you on the trajectory to do what you're going to do. And I have to say this, your name, you grew up in Pennsylvania. So Mean Joe Green, I mean, was there any influence? Did your parents name you after Mean Joe Green after watching that big famous commercial back in the day? Talk to us, bro. Tell me. No, no. And and I went to University of Pittsburgh for college and, and I got I got a lot of uh, got a lot of mileage out, out of that name. So I was really grateful. <laughs> but no, I'm actually a junior. My father, Joseph Green Sr., is uh, probably around the same age as Joe Green. So just a coincidence. But uh, yeah, yeah, people would ask me if Joe Green was my dad and I would say, yes, he is. I wasn't, <laughs> I, I, he just wasn't he just wasn't the one that played for the Steelers. And I would leave that out from time to time when it was beneficial for me. So. I got it. I got it. Well, I have to admit, you look a little bit closer to Franco Harris, to be honest with you. I'll leave that alone, too. <laughs> People asked me if I was a Steeler fan. I said I really didn't have a choice growing up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit more about your upbringing. And uh, your dad, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, was a person who was an influence in your life. Tell us a little bit about growing up in the in the Green household and what laid the foundation for you to become a, a pastor and to be involved in the stuff that you're involved with? Absolutely. So I, I was born in Washington, D.C., but at a very young age, as a matter of fact, in, um, I was born in 1967. And, you know, in 1968, there was a lot of rioting and stuff in D.C. And so my grandparents went and grabbed my mother and myself and brought us back to Harrisburg. And soon after, my mother and my father kind of separated. And so I grew up in a household where he wasn't there uh, in my formative years when I was growing up. But um, grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, my, my pop-up raised me. He was a deacon in the church. So I had this uh, firm foundation in my faith. I uh, got baptized at nine years old and um, believed that I was saved at that time, which I, I believe I am. I, I believe I still am, of course. Um, but then when I got a little bit older, I went away to college. And then I went into the military. And I did, like a lot of people, uh, uh, have done. I, I had some experiences. I went through, uh, I was in the military and uh, went through a failed marriage, which is very hurtful. Uh, the man who raised me, my, my, my pop up, I called him, um, he uh, developed Alzheimer's. And so that was very tragic. And a whole lot of things hit me at one time and I began to spin. And I did what most of us know to be the story of the prodigal son. And I was living in Virginia. I had gotten out of the military 
And I remember this was uh, well over 25 years ago that the Lord began speaking to me in my rep- <laughs> in my uh, backslidden state. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, you're going back to Harrisburg and you're going to be the pastor of St. Paul, which is the church that I grew up in. And so I chuckled because I thought I was just maybe drunk or just out of, you know, just hallucinating. <laughs> and you know how it is. I told the Lord, I said, uh, I'm not going back to Harrisburg. Uh, if I do, I, I'm not going back to St. Paul and I, I probably won't be a pastor. So fast forward uh, a few years later, the Lord, uh, like Jonah, he forced me back to back at Harrisburg. And I was really at a low point in that time. And I recommitted to my faith. And then the Lord began to restore me. And in that process, we mentioned about my father, and I think this is significant. Uh, me and my father hadn't had a relationship from the time I was very young until I was about 20, 22 years old. And so in the process of us reconciling and getting back together, I had to go through a process of forgiving my father because I knew that uh, if it wasn't for that, that um, that I, I would you know, I'd be burdened because we know unforgiveness is something that's very difficult and challenging. I also had a stepfather who was I didn't get into. He was very abusive, so I had to forgive him, too. But uh, to bring things full circle, uh, God not only brought us back to uh, Harrisburg, he brought me back to Harrisburg. Um, he restored a lot of family um, uh, family issues that we have or challenges. And then um, back in 2019, he called me to come back to Harrisburg to be, I mean, called me back to St. Paul uh, Baptist Church as the pastor of St. Paul. Um, I remember reflecting on it because when they were uh, trying to decide who they wanted to be their pastor, because the former pastor retired, and I was really kind of nervous. I thought maybe this isn't going to happen. And I said, Lord, I don't know if this is your will or not. And me and my wife were um, fasting and praying that day. And the Lord began to show me visions of myself growing up in the church as a child and being very active in the church. And then he reminded me of his promise that he said that you're going back to Harrisburg and you're going to be the pastor of St. Paul. And so he watched me through that journey. He ordered my steps. And so I believe that I'm here uh, by God's grace and that uh, I'm just so privileged and honored for me and my wife to serve as the head pastor of the church, St. Paul Baptist Missionary, St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church in Harrisburg. And real quick, the former pastor that I grew up under, under the 70s, was very instrumental in not only the civil rights movement uh, in this area, in uh, the area of Harrisburg, but he was also very forward thinking. And he recognized that being a pastor doesn't just mean staying in the pulpit and being a Christian, just doesn't mean staying in the churches, but going out and trying to shape uh, the culture and influence the environment around us. So that's the way we try to pastor and the way we lead, which is why I'm so grateful for you and and, and our relationship and um, and all the things that you're doing out in the community as well. Well, man, that is, uh, I love hearing part of these stories because uh, one, it humanizes all of us. Sometimes when you get to at a certain level and people call you pastor or apostle or whatever, um, they like you can't touch them, but all of us have a story. All of us have a journey. And uh, I'm so glad that you shared that. Um, you, myself, and uh, Apostle Culberth have that in common, uh, being raised in Missionary Baptist Church. I was uh, a young deacon at Salem Baptist Church in Marshall, Virginia. And uh, that's where I was, uh, I was licensed when I was called to preach. And uh, there's something to be said about the roots that, uh, that we come from. Uh, you know, we talk a lot uh, because of our strategic partnership with the Church of God in Christ. Uh, but, um, you know, even the Church of God in Christ, as I've read, their history uh, really came out of a holiness shoot of the Baptist Church. So anyway, thank you for sharing that uh, that part of your story. Um, tell me a little bit, Joe, uh, and those who are unfamiliar about what the 2019 movement is and what inspired you to uh, to get it started? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was looking at some of the challenges that we face as African-Americans, um, you know, and, and I know the history. I know a lot of, you know, I know a lot about history. My stepfather, who uh, was in my life for a, a number of years, he was a Black Panther. And so I knew all about that. And, and, and he always looked at everything through a racial lens. But then I had my pop up who was raised in Georgia. He was a um, um, he was you know, he grew up in he was born in 1912. So he saw racism, prejudice, Jim Crow firsthand. But he always taught me about looking at individual people and not looking at people based on the color of their skin. Uh, My stepfather, on the other hand, was very aggressive and he always looked at things through the lens of uh, of race and racism. Um, But anyway, through my journey, I, I knew that as a Christian, 
um, we have a higher calling. Our calling is not based on our skin color. You know, my salvation is not based on whether I'm black or white or anything else. It's about accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But I also recognize some of the challenges that we face in America. And I'll tell you, and, and I shared this with you before, part of my journey getting to the 2019 movement is when I became passionately pro-life. You know, I grew mm. up in a Democrat household. We were just Democrats because that's just what we were. Never really drilled down into any of the issues. Uh, but then when I recommitted to my faith and I went through a time of fasting and praying, and I remember one day going to my knees and I was kind of pro-choice, but then the Holy Spirit hit my heart and he began to minister to me about the babies that were dying. And mm. I even had a, a time where I heard babies crying in my prayer time and it really wrecked me. And in that time, I prayed, I repented for my participation in that and for not being outspoken. But then he also said, you have to, uh, you got to st stand up and say something. Um, and so as I began to look at it, even in, in regards to the biblical lens, I looked at one of the times uh, early on in the Bible where there was a mass, um, there was a mass ethnic cleansing, so to speak. It was in uh, in Egypt, when when Pharaoh wanted to murder all the babies, right, all the babies of the Hebrews, all the male children. Um, and then I looked at the time when Jesus was born and Herod wanted to do the same thing. He wanted to murder all the male children under a certain age. And I began to see this pattern and there was attack on babies, attack on males and a breakdown of the family. And there was economic oppression. And I saw that pattern in the black community. And in that time when I was really studying this out and really asking the Lord, uh, what does this mean? Um, he, he reflected on the pattern in the Bible. And the pattern was that uh, whenever God was about to move in a mighty way, that attack, those were specific attacks that were levied against a certain community. And then I said, well, I wonder you know, what year we're in. I kind of knew, but I didn't knew, know. But I knew at that time we were approaching the 400 year mark uh, that they've designated for uh, Africans that came to the shore at Fort, Com Fort Comfort, Virginia, Fort Monroe, and it was August 25th, 2019, and this was back in 2015 um, that he began to give me this strategy for not only racial reconciliation, but restoration of a destiny of a people, and so I launched the 2019 movement based on that, and I think it was strategic because I launched it in September of 2016, and I didn't know why there was a sense of urgency. And then when we saw President Trump get elected, it really exacerbated all of the uh, racial tension in America. And because of that, our message was one of reconciliation and forgiveness. And it is, I think it's helped a lot of communities uh, when we've gone out and done that. Um, but that's the basis for the 2019 movement is restoring families, it's the, it's pro-life because we understand how important it is for us to value the life of our babies. And we understand that that's one of the strategies of the enemy is always to target the babies and target men um, and all these other things that we see over and over again. And we know the enemy is is not creative. He can't do anything new. He just, uh, <laughs> he just keeps doing the same thing over and over again. So I felt if we could attack those issues, uh, it would take us a long way, not just for the Black community, but for America as a whole, because I believe that America um, has this problem that we can fix if we look to reconcile reconciliation and 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 also the restoration of a people that are feel disenfranchised. Man, I mean, I, I when I met you, you had already, um, you know, uh, you hadn't launched that, but in the course of our relationship, I remember when you did, uh, and uh, and it was powerful. Even when you, um, you know, I think there was an uh, an initiation kind of an event that you did at the uh, state capitol, I think, in Harrisburg. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was powerful and it was prophetic. It really was. I mean, because in a way it gave rise to the role that you would assume with the 400 year uh, commission. And so let everybody know what that is and tell them a little story behind it in terms of how how the Lord opened that door uh, for you, because I think it speaks to part of what we're trying to do, you, myself and others to really build this network of godly leaders to be able to be elevated to positions of influence for God's purposes. So tell us a little bit about how that happened. Absolutely. So part of the 2019 movement was really history, because in order to really reconcile, I felt like you have to have open and honest conversations. And when we look at history, we have to allow history to, to be history, to tell what it is. Uh, you know, there's a lot of editorial editorializing of history and also a lot of people that are using history to try to shape the future, which that's not what history is supposed to be about. But anyway, um, 
um, when we launched in uh, 2016, then in January of 2018, um, uh, we, well, first of all, we traveled all around and a lot of people got exposed to it, you, yourself included. And then I got this call from you and you said, hey, Joe, have you heard about this uh, federal commission? And I said, no, I haven't heard about it. You said that there's African-American History Commission. And I said, oh, wow, let me check it out. And so I checked it out and got some information about it. And I had felt, you know, during the time I was doing the 2019 movement, uh, people kept telling me God wants to give you a larger platform for this message that you have. He's going to elevate the platform. And so when I saw this commission that was uh, signed in the law uh, January of 2018, um, I began to pray and I said, I believe that this may be the platform that we can have a larger audience. And, you know, I thank God you had called me and then I called you back a couple of times and I said, Dean, you're a lot more savvy in how, how you can navigate through these congressional things, uh, because I knew it had passed through Congress, it got signed into law by the president, but I didn't know the first, uh, you know, first step in how do you get introduced to these type of things. And so you gave me some insight. I reached out to my uh, congressional, my, uh, Pennsylvania congressman, and I submitted my packet. And I believe not only God's favor, because he's the one that opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors Amen. that no man can open, uh, but more so because that he had equipped me and prepared me with a message that was tied into the 400 years of African-American history. And so uh, fast forward, I got uh, appointed to the um, I got appointed to the commission. And then uh, by the grace of God, I was elected by the other commissioners uh, to be the president, the chairman, uh, the first chairman of the commission. And we had some phenomenal people. And, you know, some of the heavy hitters on the commission, Lonnie Bunch, who's the secretary of the Smithsonian. Um, we have, uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Rex Ellis, who was the, um, vice chair of the African American History Museum in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., and a number of other people, some of them that are your yeah. colleagues as well, too many to name, I don't want to start naming people, but, <laughs> um, but just, just a few, and so I was so honored to do that, but I also believe that it was God's timing, um, and his grace that got me there, his favor, and the reason I believe that was because, uh, my message, of course, is about reconciliation. It's about looking at history, not as a way to try to villainize anyone or make anybody feel bad or even, which happens a lot, to re-victimize people because we have to be careful. When we look at history, we have to look at it through an honest and open lens and we have to have open and honest conversations so that we can move forward. And uh, I remember doing one, one presentation and I said, let's talk about the history. And then I said, but that is not then, and then, then is not now. And I was saying that to talk about how far we've come as a country. We still have challenges in our country, but we all have to acknowledge that we've come a long way. And the only way we can acknowledge that is by talking about history in an open and honest dialogue. Well, man, when you told me that uh, you were selected as the chairman, I mean, I did a dance in my, uh, <laughs> in my office, man. I was so excited, primarily because you and I know a lot of these commissions, particularly if they are, you know, dealing with black history or black initiated that, man, sometimes they get the wrong people and they just take it goes off the rails. And yeah. um, so I felt like that God had prepared you and or ordained you uh, for that time. And uh, we're grateful uh, for the leadership that you provided, because in reality, you had some moments right where. Like they wanted to take it in a direction that wouldn't be God honoring, that was to be condemning rather than simply to celebrate the successes and the triumphs that black people have had over that 400 year period. You want to share a little bit about that? Absolutely. So you remember you were there um, in D.C. at the, at the Capitol and um, was that April of 2019. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's. Uh, daughter there she was participating yep. in it her niece um, that's right that's right we had uh we had two ladies from little rock arkansas one was the african one of the african-american children who was of the you know the the first uh was it the um the first children when they when they uh desegregated that's the right. school district there and we had one of the white girls who was in the crowd that was yelling at her and they had a great conversation because they talked about what happened that day, what occurred. Right. And but it was all under the um, under the um, the theme of writing a new history. How do we move forward? How do we grow? You know, how do we get forward? And I think that those conversations are so important. We had a lot of other people that was there. But the tone always was how do we move forward as a nation? How do we heal um, and how do we reconcile? 
so that we can all, you know, I, I, I believe with every fiber of my body that uh, America's future is contingent upon this theme of reconciliation and healing of a people. Man, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because the reality is, is the examples that we follow of like a Frederick Douglass or a Martin Luther King Jr. or Booker T. Washington had that mindset. I was recently listening uh, to uh, audio of, uh, of Booker T. One of the things that I was really impressed with was how he emphasized uh, the word of God as being central uh, in the education of young uh, men and women uh, during his time period. And when we talk about the Bible and the word of God, we cannot get away from the message of redemption. I mean, Frederick Douglass was beaten, uh, scourged, went through all kinds of challenges, but yet found himself uh, forgiving the man who said that he once owned him. I've been to the, the actual house that's there on the eastern shore where uh, when his former master was uh, was almost dying and uh, Douglas was there uh, and had those words. And so thank you for exemplifying Jesus in that position, because the reality is, is that, you know, we do need to uh, highlight uh, the good, the bad and the ugly about our history. But in reality, Christ is the one who redeems all of that. And uh, I think that that redemption story is what needs to be told. So, man, thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to take the opportunity just to share with all of you, um, you know, the Douglas Leadership Institute, the Frederick Douglass Foundation, our goal really is to educate, equip, and to empower. That means that you all as leaders around the country, we want to provide best as we can opportunity for you to be elevated and to go into places of influence. And so I want to ask you that if you are not on our uh, text subscription, you can text either DLI or FDF, whichever group that you are more connected with, but you can text DLI to 877-769-0463. That's 877-769-0463. Just text DLI or FDF and they'll add you to our uh, our subscription where you'll be reminded about events like this. Uh, it is our desire to be able to put and elevate more people of God who are not committed to um, a political party, but are committed to Christ. And uh, we believe that God wants to use you. And so thank you so much, uh, Joe, for sharing that story. So let's fast forward to, uh, to Juneteenth. Now, I know that you're not a historian, but being a part of the, you know, leading the um, uh, the movement that you're a part of, as well as being, uh, you know, the former chairman for the 400-year commission. Talk to me about Juneteenth, uh, why it's important, a little bit about what it was. Uh, a lot of people are unfamiliar. If you're maybe from Texas, uh, as some of our brothers and sisters are, they've been celebrating Juneteenth as a, as a holiday for a long time, but just help people to understand what was Juneteenth? Absolutely. And I think Juneteenth, and we talked about this uh, frequently, uh, Dean, Juneteenth, I think, is the, um, is the greatest national celebration for America. I think we all should, should really rally around Juneteenth. And, um, you know, as I said, when I was growing up, my stepfather was a Black Panther, and he was... Uh, not a big fan of of the 4th of July. So we didn't have a lot of big cookouts for 4th of July. And I always wondered why. Um, and then being from Pennsylvania, we really didn't, we knew about Juneteenth, but it wasn't as big of a deal. But my friends in the South, especially from Texas, would talk about it. And so I really dug down deep into it. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar with Juneteenth, we all are familiar of the time of slavery when um, um, when Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which was supposed to go into effect January the 1st, 1st 1863, and it actually went into effect January 1st, 1863, but there were some, a lot of other challenges, uh, and the Emancipation Proclamation really only free, freed the slaves in the southern slave uh, states. So anyway, uh, a couple other things had to happen, had to occur. But then um, by 1865, when, um, you know, when, when the uh, Union Army had defeated the Confederate Army, uh, they recognized that a lot of these slave owners 
you know, they didn't have social media, they didn't have Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> so a lot of these slaves that were in these Southern um, states didn't get the memo. The slave owners weren't really excited about telling them, hey, you are now free. And they even have documentation that a lot of them wouldn't tell them during the harvest season because they wanted to continue to have that free labor. Uh, so uh, fast forward a Union Army um, that began to go through the South telling the uh, with uh, General Granger, his name always escapes my mind, General Granger and the Union yeah. Army went through the South notifying um, these slaves that they were now free. And they finally got to uh, Galveston, Texas on June the 19th, 1865. So two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, all of the slaves had officially been no, uh, notified that they were now free and they no longer had to submit themselves to chattel slavery. And so that's why where the celebration stems from. Um, and, you know, and the reason I think is such an important piece is because, you know, um, our country was founded on principles and the Bill of Rights that all men were created equal and they were, of course, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, which include life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But unfortunately, because of the formation of the country, in order for them to compromise, as most of you know, in order for them to compromise, for them to come together and have a United States, they had to allow the, the slave, the southern states to still have the institution of slavery. But this was one of the things that showed that even though we didn't get it right at the very beginning, uh, we moved towards making amends by this whole thing called Juneteenth. And so I think all Americans could rally around this because this is a celebration not just of the freeing of slaves, but of a country that is attempting to adhere to the standards that they said that they were formed under. Man, it is. Uh, this is my dream. This is really what I'm hoping. And that is that. Uh, in the future in America, that from June 19th through July 4th, there would just be a whole season of liberty celebration throughout the country where people from that, so it's almost like during the Christmas season, right? You know, right. we kind of, you know, from the time period from, uh, you know, when we have Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. <laughs> to, you know, the bowl games, you know, at the beginning of the year, this is like whole season, right? I really wish that we in America would adopt this season from Juneteenth, 19th through July 4th as like this season where we just have cookouts, um, uh, family reunions, celebrating freedom, celebrating liberation. I think it's a great opportunity for the church. One of the things that I wrote in an article um, last year I basically made the argument that Republicans and particularly Christians should celebrate Juneteenth and should be excited about it. One, it was the Union Army, not the South, that 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 basically, you know, initiated, you know, Juneteenth. For Christians in the early stages when Juneteenth first started taking root, they also referred to it as um Jubilee uh day. It was a time period where you know, slaves were set free, debts were canceled, that idea of the jubilee. And I believe that that is something that uh, we should initiate. So I'd love to say for all of those who are on this call, if you've got influence uh, yes. in your different states, just initiate this idea that we should have all kinds of celebrations, picnics, everything from Juneteenth all the way through July 4th, that this is a season of liberty, a season of celebration. And um, because, you know, in, in truth, you know, I, I won't read it, but um, I got a uh, an email uh, this past week from somebody that is on our Frederick Douglass Foundation distribution list that basically was like, he was ripping me. He was like, we need to, this is a terrible idea. Juneteenth is terrible. He's like, we need, we need to elect Donald Trump back so he can cancel Juneteenth. And in my mind, I'm not going to say what I really wanted to say, but in my, <laughs> I was like, bruh, Donald Trump was the one who in his platinum plan said that if he was elected again, he would initiate and make Juneteenth a federal holiday. So we do need to do some education uh, even within our own Christian movement sometimes for people to be better educated. Now, I do understand if you go to a Juneteenth celebration in some neighborhoods, they'll have July 4th and put an X across it. That's not what we represent. There would not be Juneteenth if there that wasn't was first Independence Day in July 4th. Absolutely. And people should also know that, you know, every July 4th, you know, 
Uh, certain black people will roll out Frederick Douglass's famous speech that he gave, I believe, in uh, 1852, which was a stinging criticism of America. He said, this is not my holiday. Frederick Douglass did say that, but that was before slavery had ended. People don't know Frederick Douglass would give four other speeches on the July, on July 4th where he would actually praise the founders as great men because America had moved from a place of slavery to a place of freedom. That's the whole idea of a more perfect union. So tell us, what would you say if a, um, let's just say, if you got an email from a, uh, a white conservative that said Juneteenth is trash, we don't need to celebrate it, we need to cancel it as a holiday, what would your response be? Well, first of all, I would say, if you love your country, you should be proud of Juneteenth. <laughs> because if we just focus on July 4th, uh, as, as African-Americans, we were still enslaved July 4th, 1776. But Juneteenth, we all got our freedom. And so if you love this country and you're patriotic, you should be proud of Juneteenth because most people don't realize this, but the uh, Western world with Great Britain and then the United States was one of the first uh, civil, uh, parts of civilization that made an open um, profession and abolished the whole institution of slavery because slavery is a thousand year old institution and it oh, still God. exists in other parts of the world. So we were the first one to make a stance. And if you look at 1776, when the country was formed, and then you look at uh, 1865, it was less than a hundred years after the formation of our country that we officially legally banned slavery in America. But you know, a couple of things, I wanna tell a quick story, but then I wanna, I wanna also address the whole thing about President Trump. So during the, the, the shutdown and, and you know, there was a lot of uh, protest, uh, we did a Juneteenth celebration. And there was a group of people that came to our Juneteenth celebration in Harrisburg, there's a bridge from the West Shore to the East Shore. And, and traditionally the West Shore was pr primarily white and the East Shore is a lot more diverse. So we marched from the West Shore to the, uh, to the East Shore, but we had all groups of people. We had white, we had First Nations, we had Hispanic, we had black, we had Asians, we had all these people marching together and you know, for Juneteenth. There was a group of people that came along with us and started marching. And when we got uh, to a certain place in Harrisburg, we all stopped and, and we were, you know, uh, giving prophetic words and prayers. And it was about reconciliation of all nations because that's what God wants. So yes, anyway, sir. long story short, the one lady was there. She had a bullhorn. I said, can I use your bullhorn? So I'm using the bullhorn and we had this magnificent thing. We prayed together. We hugged each other. Found out afterwards that these two ladies were was going to a Black Lives Matter uh, rally and they came to our rally by mistake. But they said the spirit was so beautiful in our gathering that they stuck around and she let me use her bullhorn to actually <laughs> uh, do the proclamations that we did. <laughs> so we know that love... It, uh, love overrides everything, right? Uh, so going back to Donald Trump, and you know this, Dean, during the Trump administration, because that's when the uh, the 2019 start, uh, you know, commemoration happened down in uh, Fort Monroe. Um, Donald Trump was president. He's the one that actually signed the bill in law for the African American History Commission. But he was also, I was in talks and working with some of his senior advisors to make Juneteenth a national holiday. And because it was coming to the end of his term and it was during the election cycle, like you said, part of his platinum plan was to make it official holiday. And so I was really pushing hard. I said, if you sign this in, it'll, it'll, it'll go a long way to help heal the country. But unfortunately, we weren't able to get it done in the bottom. So it was actually part of Trump was working on that. Uh, and then, thank God, it did get signed into law the, uh, in 2021. But we're just glad it happened. But at the end of the day, um, I would say that if you really love this country and you want to brag about this country, then uh, I think Juneteenth is something we can all gather around. And like you said, Dean, it would be great from June 19th to July 4th. Uh, we just have a big freedom and liberty fest for all nations, all people group. And, and I would say it would be great to have events where we intentionally invite people from other cultures to come together. That's how we really heal by, uh, you know, the message of the gospel is about preaching the gospel to all nations. And that doesn't mean that's ethnos in Greek, which is where we get the word ethnicity from. And mm -hmm. so the actual message of the gospel is to preach out, preach the gospel, to declare the gospel to all people group. Uh, and at the end of the day, the message of Juneteenth is also to me, I preached a couple sermons on this, how there's a lot of Christians who have been set free by the son of God, but they haven't been notified yet. And it's the 
proclaiming of the message of the gospel that reminds them that they have been set free by Christ. And so now we can not live as slaves and in bondage, but we can live freedom that we get from Jesus Christ. Well, and that is really the bottom line. I mean, those Christians that assembled in Texas uh, to start the Republican Party that then would trumpet Juneteenth because it was a celebration of a day of liberation, uh, to me, is really what it is about. And uh, I think that it is an opportunity for uh, people like us to honor uh, that day and to really recapture the essence of what it really meant. Uh, Frederick Douglass, you know, was again, spoke very challenging about the 4th of July prior to slavery because they were celebrating something at the same time you had people that were enslaved. But I feel like that his message afterwards, uh, particularly with referring to, uh, to Juneteenth, is something that uh, we could continue to celebrate. And so I thank you so much for the work that you've done on the 400 year commission to, again, honor the successes that we have had uh, as a group of people in this nation, uh, Black people, who basically can't say that we have moved forward without God. It is with God. And all we have to do is to point to our, you know, Negro national anthem that speaks very specifically to that. And I think that James Weldon Johnson's words uh, are very important today, because he basically said that, uh, you know, we don't want to be drunk, you know, with the wine of the world, lest we forget God. And I believe that many of us are in that place. And so I'm so grateful for the work that you've done. What we want to do is to go to uh, some questions uh, in the chat. I uh, want to remind folks that um, this is an opportunity for, for them uh, to uh, be able to ask some questions and to make some comments. And so if you see some things in the chat that you want to uh, respond to, Joe, you can. I'm reading a little bit of uh, looks like this is from Nicole Bennett saying, I'm having a let freedom ring party on June 30th with Congressman Wesley Hunt. Let's get this uh, from concept to practical. Uh, I'm all in. Well, Wesley Hunt is from Texas, so he knows a little bit about Juneteenth, I'm sure. Uh, he certainly is a patriot. I've had the opportunity to meet him on a couple of occasions, uh, but I think that that is an excellent, excellent idea. Um, and I would challenge all of us in our respective areas to look use whatever uh you know means that you have to glorify god and to uh to engage with the culture we're going to be participating in numbers of uh juneteenth events around the country because look there are people that uh want to take this country in a different direction that doesn't ultimately honor god that does not uh talk about black progress or progress for all people and uh we want to make sure that we move forward on this I see uh, Tori Snow put in a, uh, a question that says, a lot of ethnic uh, commissions emphasize activism over history. Is that an issue for the 400 year commission? This idea of activism over history? Um, no, I, I would say that uh, we were very intentional about that. And I think partially because as my time of chair, as the chairman, I emphasize that, that this is about history. It's about moving forward. It's about how do we, uh, how do we heal as a nation? And and part of it was because me being a pastor, we opened every, and closed every meeting with prayer. Um, we were constantly in prayer. We constantly acknowledged the influence of God and in, in what we did. And we 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 also looked at the fact that uh, well, my executive director is a lady by the name of Miss Addie Richburg, which you may know, Dean. She is the um, the president of the National Association for Faith and Justice. So she's a woman of God as well. And so throughout, we always acknowledge God, but it, it was always about being nonpartisan, non-biased, and just let history speak for itself. You know, we don't need to editorialize history and we don't need to use history as a crutch uh, from moving forward. And, you know, Dean, one of the things that, and I saw another question I wanted to uh, address, but, yes. you know, the, the core of the 2019 movement, when I talked about uh, Egypt coming out of, Israel coming out of bondage, it was clear in scripture that God says, I've heard the cries of my people and I'm coming to rescue you. You know, even in this movement of trying to reconcile and even during the time of slavery, we recognize that it was God who not only sustained us through slavery, but he's the one that ultimately allowed us to get to a place where we were free. Yes. Um, 
But uh, the question from Emily says, what is the best way to grab the Juneteenth conversation from the Biden woke camp and the culture? Well, part of the woke camp, uh, which most of you know is rooted and grounded in Marxism and what is known as critical theory. And so critical theory uh, tries to tear down the institutions of the Judeo-Christian Western world, especially in America. And it's very critical of all aspects of American, uh, of American society. And so what I would say and remind uh, people uh, in the woke culture that, uh, you know, especially if you're black, uh, Af uh, you know, the Europeans didn't, didn't create slavery, they actually adopted it from their African counterparts. Um, and Africa still has slave slavery where Africans are enslaving Africa. And so um, we have to recognize that this nation is not a terrible nation. All nations have issues. I still believe that the principles that this nation is founded on are the principles that are principles of prosperity and peace. There are still bad people all the way around. But at the end of the day, it's the principles that it was built on originally that allowed us to move forward. If you think about Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, he talked about our forefathers writing a promissory note. And when they went to Washington, D.C., they were simply coming with a to cash the check that the forefathers had written when they wrote the Bill of Rights. And so they didn't have to introduce any new concepts. They just had to remind the nation of the concepts that the nation was already built on, which is why that's something that we can say that, uh, you know, we've done a, a, a good job uh, of that. Hey, man, I see Dr. Linda Lee Tarver from Michigan says, um, uh, how can we address the tendency to dub Juneteenth as a black only celebratory? It is thought about that way. Um, you know, I would first say that when we try to do events, we're hosting one here in Washington, DC on June the 19th. And uh, some of our biggest sponsors for that event are not black led organizations. We do have some, but um, I think that number one, Juneteenth would not have happened if it weren't for white people and black people. And I think that it's an opportunity for us to honor, you know, President, uh, you know, Lincoln, uh, who put that forth uh, to those who are in the military, uh, because it was the Union Army and General Granger who uh, actually made that proclamation. Uh, I think that sometimes it is a difficult thing because many people think of it, you know, as a, as a black holiday because they were, you know, Black Americans who were enslaved. But I think that there are meaningful ways to help engage others. Um, and I think particularly for those of us that are more conservative, uh, it's a great opportunity for conservatives to be able to engage with something that is not going to be offensive to them. There are some Juneteenth celebrations that we might go to where they're, they're honoring and celebrating stuff that we don't support. And uh, I think that we should uh, take every opportunity to uh, engage with others and really to help educate others. I'm really proud of the Family Research Council, Hillsdale College, uh, that has a great statue of Frederick Douglass on their campus, uh, Liberty University. There are a lot of schools and um, I would say, you know, uh, white evangelical groups that are partnering with us to do this. And so I would say to identify uh, some of those type of groups going into it and, uh, and, and to join uh, to do that together. I, I'll also mention that um, the Gloucester Institute led by uh, K. Coles James, they have a beautiful property uh, down there uh, in uh, part of Virginia. And uh, they have uh, invite all kinds of people to come out to have games and festivals. Uh, and it is you know not just African-Americans. So Joe, you have anything to add to that? No, I think those are great points, Dean. I think that uh, the conversation is important. Maybe if we talk to our white colleagues and say, this is the, the whole nation was, uh, was affected by this whole issue of slavery in the Civil War. And, and not only that, but like I said, when I, when I share with some people about my stepfather and how he really experienced prejudice and racism and bias um, and, and why he wasn't a big fan of July 4th. Like I said, I, I believe in July 4th. I celebrate it. I, uh, you know, I went in the military. I love my country. Um, but I also recognize some of the deep-seated wounds that some people have. So when we have that conversation of why it is that he wasn't a big fan of July 4th, I think it should help uh, to say that, hey, but we did get it right, though. I mean, we did get to a place where we recognize that slavery was inherently evil, and we made it illegal in this nation. And so, like I said, open and honest and real conversations 
are important. You can't really force things on people, but you can have a, you know, as the Bible talks about, even when we're talking about scripture, always be ready to give an account for what you believe and why you believe it. And the person that really has a heart to listen to you, I think will listen and, and hopefully respond. Amen. Are there any other questions that you see, Dr. Uh, Joe, that you want to respond to? I see some good ones. I was going to bring out some. There were some that were asking about, uh, you know, helping to, you know, our youth so that they don't get indoctrinated and radicalized. Um, do you guys do anything at your church or anything in your neighborhood with youth to help them better understand these foundational truths? Yeah, we have uh, we have a youth group. I also had a um, uh, mentoring program. It's not right now currently running called the Josiah Project. And we just look to identify young leaders and thought, le you know, thought leaders and really equip them and educate them to um, to be able to have those conversations and for them to be equipped. Because when we don't have those conversations, uh, other people will have those conversations. And if they're leading the narrative, then we'll have a difficult time many times trying to bring things back around. And so we should be intentional about having these conversations with our young people, talk to them about history, hopefully get them uh, excited about learning about history through history in a way that they will see through the true lens of what actually happened. And also to, to, to look at the fact that although we were in, enslaved at some point in time, that look how far we've come. And even in the midst of slavery, uh, we did some great things as a community. And so, um, yeah, just have real open and honest conversations, be proactive in having those conversations and just, you know, let's really teach history and not uh, editorialize it. Look, man, we've uh, come to the end of our time. I want to highlight for those of you who are part of us, uh, if you have not, uh, please text uh, FDF to that number 877 seven six nine zero four six three and that way you'll be ensured to be on our update list to uh to make sure that there's nothing that that we have going on that you that you miss um, we want to build uh this family uh of support and to honor god uh through the work that we do through the douglas leadership institute and the frederick douglas foundation pastor joe i want to give you the opportunity for any closing words before we turn it over to apostle culbert for some last minute uh, highlights. Well, I'm just, uh, again, I'm just honored about, uh, you know, what we're, our discussion today and, and being here. I think that these are important conversations because, uh, again, when you look at the left and you look at people that are pushing CRT or, or anything like that, I think it's because we're silent a lot of times. You know, even in the churches, one of the things I did with the 2019 movement is I went intentionally, not just the Black people, but I went to white people and all different uh people groups to have these conversations because a lot of times people don't know what they don't know. And so when we enlighten them about these things, because uh, it is mandatory that we preach the gospel to all nations, that's what heaven looks like, right? Every tribe and every tongue coming together. And what we also did, which was vitally important, is we did what's called the prayer of forgiveness, Dean. And I think you might have been in one of those. And we said we are intentionally choosing to forgive because part of what I believe is there's some deep-seated wounds in Black America that we haven't dealt with. And because of that, we are constantly getting triggered by things of the past. And they bring up things from the past as though they are still presently happening. And until we get to a place where we can allow Christ to, to mend our hearts and allow us to forgive, it's going to be difficult for us to even move into the fullness of what God has for us. And so, again, uh, I just I'm, I'm thankful for this. We got to always look at forgiveness and reconciliation because that's what's going to make us whole and really set us free. And uh, and I think that as we celebrate these things together, um, it really will become the great nation that it was called to be. Amen. Brother, thank you so very much. And want to thank all of you uh, for your participation. Uh, Apostle Colbleth, why don't you make our last announcements before we close out and certainly close us with a prayer? Absolutely. What an incredible discussion. Um, we will rebroadcast this recording on uh, next Friday, June the 16th. I want to encourage you to uh, stay tuned to our uh, social media on uh, Facebook as well as on YouTube, and you'll be able to see that uh, rebroadcast there. Share it uh, with others. Um, such exciting conversation, ways to engage history to engage scripture, uh, to impact the culture. So exciting. Thank you all again for joining us. And I'm gonna close out with a word of prayer. Father, we, uh, we thank you. We thank you for this discussion. We thank you for ongoing equipping. 
ongoing education and enlightenment, Father, ongoing um, uh, grassroots activism, oh God, in our communities for the cause of Christ, for the advancement of your of your kingdom, for for the uh, the lifting of others. Oh God, bless every individual, every family, every church, every um, organization and ministry represented on this call, Father God. Provide us with the necessary resources such that we can do all that you've called us to do. And Father, help us not to uh, operate in silos, Father, but to seek one another out, to build relationship, to collaborate, oh God, because we're stronger together than we are separately. Father, bless the remainder of our evening, bless our week, and we give you the honor and the praise in Jesus's name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Huge thanks to uh, all of you. Deborah Honeycutt, Terry McCann, Nicole Bennett, Bill Cleveland, Jerry Bennett. Thank you guys for being a part. Uh, Professor Barbara Massey, Tom Cacadellas, Marcus Williams. Thank you guys. We appreciate you so much. I see Kai Hunt, Vita Jackson, uh, uh, also, William Montier, uh, my cousin from North Carolina, Hezekiah Anderson, grew up with me in First Asheville Baptist Church. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I look, I'm so grateful for all of you, uh, Marquita, uh, Katrina, Pastor Cheryl Gaines. Thank you guys so very much for joining us. Um, uh, Andrew Banks, Pastor Jewel Simmons, thank you guys so much. Pastor uh, Keith, uh, thank you so much for being a part of it. Uh, we love you guys. Appreciate you so much. And join us if you are in the DMV for our big Juneteenth celebration that will come up on June 19th, which will be celebrated right there in Tyson's Corner with uh, the Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Winsome Sears. God bless you all. Have a fantastic evening.